Hello to everybody that's joining this workshop on menu planning for young children. The primary reason that I've been motivated to do this workshop is that I get the question from a lot of parents to actually develop a menu for them. Of course, as a dietitian, I'm qualified to do that. But if I develop a menu for parents, the menu is very transient, meaning menus change as children grow older. Menus change also in regards to seasons, where you are at that stage, your routine, your regime, and also the care that they get. For example, are they nursery? Are they at school? So do they get a full meal at nursery? Do they get a full meal at school, for example? So what I prefer to do always is, is teach the basic skills for developing a menu. If you understand the basic skills and the basic principles for a menu planning, honestly, it's the easiest thing you can do and you can adjust it to any type of diet. What I suggest you do also during this workshop, it is a workshop, I'm not doing it live, you are listening to it in a recording, is that you pause me and I will kind of give you the prompt when you pause me so that you can keep up with filling in your own menu because the idea would be after this workshop you have a one week uh, menu in front of you. Right, so uh, I'm going to start uh, um, by sharing my screen and starting with this menu and looking at uh, the primary objective. So what we're going to do is look at the important macro and micronutrients to consider when planning a menu. Those are the nutrients that when I as a dietitian plan a menu, I keep in the back of my mind. How to incorporate child or family dietary requirements, because I'm sure people that are listening to this workshop would be those who are vegetarian, vegan, or those with specific uh, allergy requirements, milk-free, egg-free, nut-free, or a combination of those and then take you through a step-by-step -step approach for planning a menu for young children, but tailoring that the menu also suits the whole family. As we go through, I'll try to give you some tips. Um, and you can, like I said, you can pause me and, and try to incorporate some of those tips. And hopefully by the end, um, you will have a good idea of, of not only for one men a week menu, but for two or three week menus. And then finally, ensure sustainable eating. I think that's also really important now we start planning our menus. Right, so what are the important nutrients? Uh, and we will go through those as we plan the menu. Proteins, you always start your menu around your proteins and, and that's always the most important nutrient uh, in particular when it comes to growth for children. Energy, so your carbohydrates and your fats, so they spare the protein to be used for growth for children. Fruit and vegetables, so these contribute vitamins and minerals and trace elements. And then those uh, micronutrients or minerals and trace elements that are critical, iron, calcium, iodine, omega-3 fatty acids that we also need to take into account. So that is your list and you can actually write them down next to you. Um, those are the ones that you want to uh, make sure that every meal or every day hits these micronutrients either during the day or during the week. Right, then the next aspect is your dietary requirements. Now, Dietary requirements may be family specific, but it may be also person specific. So it could be that, for example, that um, your daughter or your son is milk and egg free, but you as parents are not. But that means you need to actually apply a menu that fits for both or is adjusted that you can adjust the meal for yourself, who's not milk and egg free, uh, and make a meal more flexible. What I've decided to do just as an example for you today is I've used the flexitarian approach. So that means I've got, uh, it's a, an environmental approach where we have a lot of uh, vegan vegetarian options, which means also it's quite easy to adjust if you've got allergies in particular cow's milk allergy. So a lot of these can be swapped out. Uh, and I'll show you at the end if there's a nut allergy, how you can swap these out as well. But it's important to once you've got your um, primary nutrients sorted out to say, okay, what is the approach in terms of dietary requirements that we're taking for the family? This is the first time that I think you need to pause this recording. Um, and either you start an Excel spreadsheet in front of you, or you have this on paper. And that's to decide your meals 
and your snacks. <coughs> Apologies. Now, I've put here seven days. Uh, I've put breakfast, a snack, a lunch, a snack, a dinner, and a snack. Now, first of all, snacks are not essential for young children. Uh, depending on your child and the activity of your child, you get children that have three big meals and they don't want snack and, uh, snacks and giving them snacks, in fact, uh, prevents them from eating a, a bigger meal. Or you've got children that actually eat smaller meals but prefer to have snacks. So I have put in snacks, but you can cut them out and actually make the snacks part of your meal because snacks are often just fruit or a, a small amount of cheese and things like that. So I'll show you as we go along how you can adjust your snacks uh, and use them to your benefit and, and move them towards a meal rather than having them as a snack. In my experience, the younger the children, um, the more reliant they are on snacks in particular to get their fruit in and also their milk, the amount of milk they need for bone growth. So, and the older they get, the less reliant they are on snacks uh, in between their meals. Snacks are exactly what the word snacks mean. They are not a meal. They are really a piece of fruit. It might be a cracker with a small piece of cheese, but they're not supposed to be small little meals. Right, so, uh, I'm hoping now you've got your little table in front of you. Uh, let's start and think about how we're going to fill in this table. As I already highlighted, the start is always the protein choice. And this is important for you to actually make your own table of the different protein choices you have in your family. The way I like to divide them is into meat protein, fish protein, pulses, nuts and seeds, dairy and egg and other. So it might be that if you are uh, actually um, pescatarian, you cut out the whole meat protein category. So they are not part of your choices. Um, it might be that you say, actually, my child has a fish allergy. We are, then you cut out this category. If your child has got a nut allergy, you just delete from all of these proteins, those foods that your child is allergic to. But it's good to have a little table because we often get really stuck in a rut that we uh, think, oh, I've had chicken, so I'll have chicken tomorrow again. And, and I'm sure there will be uh, proteins that I've not gotten here that, that you are consuming, but it just gives you an idea. In my meat protein, I have put offal and I've put liver a little bit apart. It's not that it's bad. Uh, clearly liver is a great source of iron, but it's extremely high in vitamin A. For the mothers listening to this workshop, you will remember that during pregnancy, there was a, you would, uh, they would advise not for you to have the liver. So for children, if you want to have liver, it's no more than once a week. Offal like heart or if you have kidneys, those of course can be consumed more frequently as they are not very rich in vitamin A. Um, I wanted to kind of bring here pulses, uh, nuts and seeds. Um, I've also put in pumpkin seeds, chia seeds, flax seeds. They're great sources of protein. And we'll talk about the type of protein and the contribution. And uh, they also pr provide your essential amino acids. So they do count as a good protein source. And they've got some other benefits, selenium, zinc, like also uh, in your meat protein. Your dairy and egg here are in particular high, uh, uh, the dairy is particularly high in, 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 in calcium. And then we've got quinoa, which does count as a protein source. It does contain all of the amino acids and corn, um, uh, which is a mycoprotein, but it's very rich in protein as well. So you will find as we go along, your protein is not only a source of protein, but it can contribute your iron, can contribute omega-3 fatty acids. If you think it's selected nuts and, and oily fish, it can contribute zinc, selenium, uh, dairy, for example, contributes vitamin A, can contribute B vitamins. So your protein brings to the table some other nutrients as well. When you're planning, Every meal should have a source of protein and you need to vary the protein sources. That's not only because uh, uh, it's good to have variety, but as you can already see, the different protein sources provide different nutrients, right? So let's take this list and fill it into that table um, by considering all of the micronutrients, right? So. When you're thinking about the micronutrients in red, 
I have put those proteins that are high in iron. There's some small differences, of course, uh, if you're going into the science, of course, white fish is not quite as high as, for example, beef in terms of iron, but the difference is quite small in the grand scheme of things. But the, the ones in red are really high in iron. Those in orange contain iron, so they're not a bad source of iron, but they're factors that impact the absorption. So for example, in lentils, they contain quite a lot of fiber called phytates. And so the bioavailability of the iron in lentils is slightly lower. Egg contains some, some iron, but actually contains phospholipids. So it's a specific type of fat, which binds the iron and also makes the absorption a little bit lower. Similar quinoa, corn, all of those do contain iron, but because of the, uh, the um, fiber content, it's slightly lower. So these are good iron sources, but if you are vegetarian or vegan, they will need to be combined with some vitamin C source just to increase the absorption. In green, dairy is really not a great source of iron unless it's supplemented. So, for example, infant formula is highly supplemented with iron, but dairy per se is not. So consuming excessive amount of dairy, I call them my milkaholics, and that's defined by above 500 milliliters or a pint of milk, that is actually excessive and uh, can actually have a detrimental effect on your iron. So you want to aim for two iron-rich protein sources per day. Amongst those iron-rich sources is both the orange and the red, but the orange we want to make sure that we also have some kind of fruit with them or a vegetable that contains some, uh, some vitamin C. Okay, so the next thing is we need to consider what are the calcium sources. So again, I've used the same kind of way of marking what are great calcium sources in terms of your proteins. So of course, milk, cheese, and yogurts are great calcium sources. And here I want to also have a chat, you know, soya, soya products, these Plant-based milks, oat milks, I know we're talking now about protein, but just want to say, if you're using a plant-based milk for calcium, you cannot use an organic because they're not calcium enriched. So you need to use a non-organic. They are all designed to match calcium in cow's milk. So if you are matching 100 milliliters of calcium enriched soya milk or a soya yogurt, um, then it would have the same amount of calcium that you would have in uh, uh, normal milk, cheese, and yogurts. So those are products that are high in calcium. Of course, there are proteins also that contain calcium. There are selected tree nuts, for example, almonds that contain um, calcium, uh, sesame seeds, so tahini is also very high in calcium. What I've not highlighted because it's, 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 um, it's, it's not an outlier, but I, I wanna mention it. So in terms of oily fish, if you have sardines that are in a tin where there are bones in those sardines and you mash it up, so it's the bone part, then sardines as an oily fish, for example, becomes calcium rich as well. So there are other calcium sources as well that are plant-based, but here we're really talking about the protein choices. So per day, you want two to three portions of calcium rich foods per day. These are often mainly milk products or milk replacements that are calcium rich. So just in your mind, you already have got, so you need protein, a protein source with every meal during the day. Then you need to take into account with the protein sources, the iron quality within the protein sources. Then you need to take into account those protein sources that also contain calcium. And we're coming to the uh, last one, it's those protein sources that also contain omega-3 fatty acids. Now, omega-3 fatty acids are essential fatty acids that the body cannot produce themselves. Uh, amongst the essential fatty acids are also omega-6 and omega-9 fatty acids. Omega-6 and omega-9 fatty acids are abundant in most of our diets. And in fact, the balance of consumption is excessive normally of omega-6 and omega-9. So omega-6 and omega-9 come from your poly, many of your polyunsaturated fatty acids. For example, sunflower oil, um, many of the, the nut butters, 
uh, full cream milk products uh, contain these omega-3 fatty uh, six and nine fatty acids. So it's, that's why we focus a lot of times on the omega-3 fatty acids. A great source is of course oily fish. That's salmon, fresh tuna, not tinned tuna, mackerel, sardines, um, uh, and those type of oily fish. Um, for tuna, of course, because of the mercury, con mercury content, you don't want more than once a week. Uh, that's maximum in terms of the tuna. Um, and then in terms of tree nuts, yes, there are also tree nuts that contain omega-3 fatty acids. For example, um, they're uh, walnuts. Uh, I've put them in orange and come to that. The same is pumpkin seed, chia seeds. Flax seed is extremely high in omega-3 fatty acid. Hemp seed as well. Now, the, the difference is between the orange and the red uh, is, of course, the level of omega-3 fatty acids, but also the type of omega-3 fatty acids. You get different types of omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and in particular, your fish oils contain uh, the, a specific type called decosahexanoic acid and acosapentanoic acid, which you don't get from the plant types. Um, but, it, you know, your body can convert a small amount from the plant types to that. So most of the time, if I have a child that is vegan, that is on unsupplemented milks, for example, because your formula milks contain omega-3 fatty acids, I recommend that they take an omega-3 fatty acid that is sea-based. So you can get, for example, a sea algae-based omega-3 fatty acid that's got the same type of omega-3 than you get in fish oil if you want to be a vegan or vegetarian. So you want to aim for at least two omega-3 fatty acid-rich sources per week. Um, and you can vary those between your plant and your fish oils uh, during the week. And as I said, if you want to be vegan, then it's good practice to have a source of um, sea source, like a, a sea algae source of a vegan omega-3 fatty acids, because there's a specific type of omega-3 fatty acid that, that you don't get from uh, the, the plant sources. So now you've got your um, schedule in front of you. And what you would want to do is first of all, follow the, your rules. You want to add for every meal, a protein source. So take your time now to put for breakfast, lunch and dinner, a protein source. Have next to you your list of protein sources that are available to you and your family and start just by putting protein sources for breakfast, lunch and dinner. And I would uh, pause here uh, the, this uh, workshop to give you some time uh, to kind of just fill in your, um, your protein sources. So I'm sure you've now uh, filled in your protein sources and you can see I have got milk um, for many of my breakfast sources. I've uh, got um, egg, also varied egg during the week, but I've also got plenty of plant-based sources. As I said, my menu is more flexitarian. So I've only got red meat twice um, during the week on a Sunday and a Monday, and you, you can do more if that's what your family's diet is like. I've got chicken here uh, twice. Now, clearly you can replace it with turkey or with other poultry if you wanted. I've got my fish here twice and the rest are all plant-based protein sources. But although we've now ticked the first rule, we've got protein for every meal, you can clearly see we've not yet ticked some of the other rules we had. So some of the other rules we had was we need once or twice a week at least an oily fish. So we need to make sure that some of these fish sources are oily fish. It's not just white fish. The other important aspect is we need to make sure that twice per day we have iron rich sources. So now go through your meal and your menu thinking of what are your iron rich sources. So for example, day one, I've got fish and red meat, two iron rich sources. They are both in my red category. But on day two, I've got here, I've got nut butters, 
um, and I've got here a, a, a egg and I've got fish. You can see that's a red, a good source, but two plant-based sources. Day three, milk. Do you remember milk is not a great source, but I've got ticked here, two sources, chickpeas and chicken, both good iron sources. And so you go through every day and saying, have I got two sources that are also iron rich per day? Okay. The next rule is, have I got two to three milk portions per day? Now you can already see that's not the case. So although you've got protein on every meal, you can see there are several days where you have not got sufficient milk uh, portions. So that means you would not be meeting your calcium requirements. So you need to correct for that. So the way to correct for that, so you can see what I've done is um, it's two to three portions. Now, a lot of parents say to me, what is a portion? That depends on your age. But if I take a one to three year old, for example, uh, a milk portion would be 150 milliliters of milk and cheese would be around 20 grams. So it's about a matchbox. So you can see that here, most days I've got two to three and you, you, some days it might be two, some days it might be three. So you increase the portions of the yogurt, for example, on the days where you just have two portions and some days where you have three portions, you can reduce your portions. So you can see here, I've brought in here uh, milk in the evening. Um, that's an easy one. But if your child does not like milk, you can replace the milk with yogurt. A child does not need to drink milk. It's all around the milk products. And if you are vegan, we'll talk at the end, I'll show you an example of a child with a milk allergy. This can be a calcium enriched milk, uh, uh, plant-based milk as well as a replacement, like for example, a soya milk. If you're soy allergic, it needs to be, for example, an oat milk, which is high in protein, but it cannot be organic. Okay, so now if you count it through, you can see, um, for example, Monday, we've got three, kind of um, milk um, or milk related portions. On Tuesday, we have two, that's also fine. On three, uh, Wednesday, we've got two. On Thursday, we have two, uh, sorry, we've got three. So two to three is what you've got. Remember your body does not work in 24 hours. So if on one day you have a bit more calcium and on the other day less, that's absolutely fine. You can have a day where there's much more milk products and then on another day, much less in terms of milk products. Okay, so now we've got um, also our omega-3 fatty acids. I've put here salmon. Um, as an omega-3 fatty acid source. And I've brought here some ground flaxseed as another omega-3 fatty acid. I've brought in here mixed nut butter. So if you wanted to, walnut can be part of it. Walnut is extremely high in omega-3 fatty acids. So you can see we've now got proteins every meal. We've got iron rich sources twice a, a, a day. We've also got our twice a, a week omega-3 fatty acids and we've got our calcium sources. Um, just as a, a side note for those of you who are a vegetarian, egg, if you can have egg on a daily basis, that's not a problem for you as adults. Uh, we know now for the last 10 years already that the, the cholesterol egg is not very bioavailable. It's the cooking method. So for you as an adult, it's the frying and butter that's a problem. So if you poach for yourself an egg or you boil an egg, that's not um, a, a concern for your cholesterol. So we've now done um, the protein. So, uh, and we've targeted the proteins towards the nutrients. So let's move on. Now we're looking at your carbohydrates. And here again, what I would do is I would pause the recording of this workshop and I would do a little table of which are the carbohydrates that you've got available to you. And that, uh, that can be uh, if uh, you have or somebody in the family's got celiac disease or a gluten intolerance, then of course you take out all of the gluten uh, sources. So in your grains, I've got here your wheat, your spelt, your oat, barley, and of course oat, you can get a gluten-free oat uh, and corn, rice, sorghum, millet, teff, amaranth. 
I've got quinoa here. I've put quinoa again aside because quinoa kind of overlaps. It does have, a, a, it's a grain, it does have some carbohydrates, but as you already could see from uh, bef uh, before, it also contains protein. And then to think about your starchy vegetables, potato, tapioca, and cassava. A lot of parents ask me, what about butternut squash? Or what about parsnip or sweet potato? <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. So they, yes, they are more starchy, but they don't count as a full starch or carbohydrate replacement because they are not as rich as, in starch as, for example, your tapioca, cassava, and potato. And then I've put buckwheat into in terms of other, although buckwheat has got the word, word wheat in there, it is a, um, it's a pseudo grain. It actually is more related to uh, to your rhubarb, that then it's in fact related to uh, a grain, but it's rich in, uh, in starch. Now, a lot of parents ask me, why do you want to have a starchy sauce with every meal? Uh, it's actually a very simple answer. You need non-protein energy for protein to be used for growth and development. For us as adults, the paleo diet or the Atkins diet or the high protein diet, whatever you call it, has become popular because you lose weight, because you cut out a whole food group. And if you cut out carbohydrates, then your body does not have glucose, a fast source of glucose. So it actually converts your protein into sugars, into glucose. It's a very ineffective pathway and is conducive for weight loss. That's of course not what we wanna achieve in a growing child. So you do want to make sure that there is some form of uh, starch within every meal. Um, and uh, because of the growth. So once you've got your list now down, we are going to go and look at our menu again. So again, pause me here, have to your side, your starchy sauces and start putting the different starches that you have. And there's nothing wrong with repetition, okay? I will show you when we start looking at putting a detail, but you can see already, I have put here oat porridge and bread for breakfast, because a lot of time you want, you are on a tight rope in the morning with time. So you need to get out of the house. So what you want is something that is quick, that is fast. And I've put, you know, over weekend, uh, egg and toast soldiers. So a lot of time over weekend, you've got a much more time. And you see, I've put something interesting for Sunday. I'll come to that egg and a wheat sauce, because often we think, what can we do for a more interesting breakfast as a family on a Sunday? Then I've added also um, here some rice, some pita bread, some bulgur wheat. So I've varied the type of grains, um, but I've also repeated. Um, repetition is not bad. Uh, and repetition often helps you, for example, on a Sunday meal, you've had red meat and potatoes to repeat and saying, okay, on a Monday, I'm going to use leftovers. That's a principle you can use for any of the meals. You could say, okay, I'm going to cook something on a Tuesday and leftovers on the Wednesday. There's nothing wrong with that. So you can plan your menu that way as well. I've not done this now. I've been very, um, uh, you know, big variety. But if you want to do that and if you <clears throat> wanting to repeat some of the foods, nothing wrong with that. So you can see now I've repeated um, and put uh, starchy sauces. I've put here also, we had had snacks here um, and on a, we have here cheese and rice. Uh, I've put in rice cakes and I've put here cheese and corn crackers. That's going to be a really small portion. It's just a snack. It's nothing else but a snack. Um, your snacks, you can also bring into the afternoon. I've got the mid morning because some of the children, for example, in the afternoon do sport. So then your cheese and rice crackers could be, if your uh, child does um, some uh, swimming, then it would be good to have a snack there. So vary your snacks also where it's suitable for your child, where you want a bit, of, a bit more robust snack around their activity. Right, so we've not now got our carbohydrates or starchy foods in with every meal. 
Now we're going to look at the fruit and the vegetables. Again, here, uh, I'm sure I've left some of the fruit and vegetables out and I can, you know, I've not, these are the fruit and vegetables that I have uh, around uh, regularly, depending on summer or, or winter. I've not got Jerusalem artichokes here. I've not got white asparagus. All of those type of things are seasonal. But think about those fruit and vegetables. Um, and that's why it's so important to individualize your menu and that the menu changes because your menu, for example, between September and November would be more rich in your squashes and in mushrooms. Um, and your menu coming, for example, March, April, May, is going to be more rich in your, your um, berries, for example. So uh, this needs to vary. Uh, and it's important to vary if we want to have more sustainable eating. So list them. I've put here in particular for fruit and vegetables, them in color categories. That's such an easy tip. Different colors give different vitamins. So, for example, carrots, beta carotene high, spinach gives you some vitamin A, but it's very high in folic acid, can give you a small amount of calcium, very high in vitamin C. So by changing and varying the different colors in your vegetables, you automatically meet different vitamins and minerals. And that's a, a good tip when you're looking at your menu and saying, which colors do I have? And that is not only colors in terms of your vegetables. It might be that you're saying, I'm going to have spinach, but I'm going to have frozen mango, for example, and defrost it and put it in a little pot, uh, compote uh, as a dessert. So you've got mangoes very high also in vitamin A. So you've got your different combinations here. Uh, so uh, ensure that you've got five portions of vegetables and fruit. That normally kind of works out at three vegetable portions or, um, and two fruit portions. Um, and an easy way to think about portions of vegetables, it's looking at your child's hand. So if you're thinking of berries or grapes, and I think uh, most of us give too many grapes, is what a portion is what they can hold on your hand in their hand, sorry, it's not in your hand, in their hand. So that can be uh, raspberries in a, a two to three year old, it can be just three or four raspberries, that would be a portion. And that's the same for grapes. Um, and for uh, mango, it's really, what do you see, how big is the little fist? That is a portion of fruit. So most of the time we overestimate and, and be careful here of your compots and your purees. A lot of time we kind of go, okay, I'll just give them a whole pouch, but a whole pouch, in fact, is two, at least two portions of fruit. So think about your fruit here. It does not need to be big portions of fruit. Right. So now you've got your menu that's already got the protein. It's got the carbohydrates. You've got your milk products. You've got your omega-3 fatty acids in there. So now you are going to have your little list of fruit and vegetables next to you. You're going to fill those in as well. So it's going to become quite busy. So I've put in here, you know, uh, things that work really easy. Again, for the morning, I've thought about getting out of the house, so bananas, uh, you know, apples, dried cranberries and dried fruit. Again, be careful, dried fruit. You know, you don't give a whole box, you give a small portion. Um, and here also banana, I have repeated pear. Um, and where I don't have a fruit uh, for breakfast, I've brought it in as a, a, a snack. And you'll see wherever I've put twice, I've kind of said, okay, on a Saturday, Saturday often it's a different day. So you want it to be more relaxed. So uh, it means I need to give more vegetable crudités uh, for lunch, we're doing cheese and crackers with a fruit platter. You want to have double the portion because you don't have fruit anywhere else. That's very easy to do with your meals because remember the portions are quite small and you can easily bring two fruit or two vegetable portions in, in one meal. So when you're counting here, for example, that's one portion banana, one here, uh, green beans, two portions, apple three, then a uh, mixed salad, four, and a piece of fruit, five. And, and each day kind of uh, uh, we have followed this rule with uh, either double vegetables, for example, here with, where we have egg, bread, and vegetable crudités, I will make sure that there are two vegetables in there. 
Um, and so here uh, with a salmon pasta, I've got sweet potato and broccoli, so I've brought in two vegetables. That's really easy to kind of make up. And again, also for you, especially for those of you who've got toddlers, I know how it works with toddlers, they have their favorite vegetables. So if it means that you're saying, Rezana, I'm putting here peas, peas and peas, and I'm putting here broccoli, 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 as long as you then start looking, can I vary my fruit? Can I bring in carrot? So you can meet all of your vet, uh, vitamin and mineral requirements with four to five clever fruit and vegetables, different colors, for example, of fruit and vegetables. So don't stress, that is absolutely possible. You can also meet vegetable requirements and, uh, by um, mixing it into a stew that is also easily available. So you can see also what I brought in here, I brought some compots, uh, and uh, berries. So what I often do in the winter uh, is I use frozen uh, berries and, and then stew them uh, uh, with, uh, with some other fruit. Uh, that way um, you can go and still be sustainable. So you're not buying them imported outside of season. Um, and most of the berries, you can look where they come from on the frozen so you can get them from the country of origin. Um, and you can make little compots there uh, and have them ready. You can even fr uh, freeze those little small compots. I normally do them with apple or with pear. These work really well together and, and you can uh, have them and uh, freeze them in portions. During the summer months, I kind of they do them in ice lollies uh, and you can mix them with yogurt and therefore you have a ice lolly that already has a portion not only of milk protein and calcium but also fruit. Right, step four now is uh, you have put in all of your foods but we've not put the frills in. How are you going to cook it? What are you going to make to do it to that it's interesting? Um, and, and here the tips are really to vary also your cooking methods. So uh, you think about uh, you want to have different textures, so it might be that sometimes you stew. Uh, that is also defined by different uh, times of the year. Now during the winter you'd be more up to stewing or even making soups um, with different foods in them. Uh, but you want to also sometimes want to have uh, roasted because you want to expose your children to different textures. That's in fact, especially the younger ones, it's critical to make sure that they have different textures. Above the age of one, they want to be in charge and often they migrate more to wanting to have finger foods. Uh, when you're roasting or frying, consider the fat source. So fat is also really important. Uh, uh, children should not be on a low fat diet. So you don't want to fry in butter. Butter has a very low heating temperature so that it changes to a fat that is carcinogenic. So when you are frying, you want to have a source of fat that has a higher heating temperature. A lot of parents ask me and saying when they read, they find olive oil does not have a high heating temperature. And it depends on which type of olive oil. So if you just use a normal olive oil, it has a heating temperature. You can do roasting and frying in them. Otherwise, sunflower um, uh, seed oil or flaxseed oil, both of these are really good. It's good to use a variety of different oils because they contain different properties. For example, uh, sunflower oil is a polyunsaturated fatty acid. Uh, flaxseed oil contains some omega-3 fatty acid. Um, olive oil is a monounsaturated fatty acid. So you have different ones. And if you said to me, can I drizzle some oil as, as long as your uh, child is not overweight, and that's also important, then I would say to you, absolutely fine to use oil in your cooking. Herbs and spices, go mad on herbs and spices, from coriander to, um, to cumin, to anything that you normally use, it's just salt and sugar that you should be avoiding. Think about reusing foods, pre-cooking, freezing. It might be that you say, as I said to you, doing cooking on one day, reusing on the other day, or it might be that on a Saturday, you look at the menu and on a Saturday, you're cooking actually all of the meals and you just freeze or you have your uh, uh, meats or uh, and vegetables cooked and you just do, for example, a toast with it or you do uh, a potato with it. That is really up to you. So you can plan and then take this menu that we discussed now and saying, okay, that I'm going to do over the weekend, that can be frozen to make your life easy. 
you need to consider how much time you've got available to cook. So often, you know, a roast is something that you can do on a Sunday, but it's not something that you can do on a weekday. Days that you can eat together, that's so important. So plan your menu around uh, something, you coming home at six o'clock, let's say from work, those on a Tuesday and a Thursday, you can eat together and on a weekend. So make sure that those days where you can eat together, these are fast meals that you can do really quickly and you can just add something to it. And then seasonal foods, frozen versus fresh, as I already said, I often use during the winter months, I really use frozen uh, and I use also frozen peas and things like that. Have your, your veggies that you can't get fresh during the winter months in particular, have those trusted veggies in your freezer. Um, it's, they, don't, they are often more, uh, retain much more of their vitamins uh, um, b during the freezing time. So they are not bad to have frozen and they're really fast and you can get a good variety in that way. Right, so now what I have done, it's become really full, as you can see. I've put in where before I had lentils, I've said, okay, I want to have dal. So, and that dal, I'm going to freeze on the Monday and I'm going to use it again here on a Thursday. Nothing wrong with that. And I'm just going to cook some rice and uh, put a different uh, veggie, roast the vegetables. I'm going to, the lamb roast that I'm having on the Sunday, I'm going to use that lamb roast and changing into a stew on the Monday. And I'm going to use the leftover potatoes and just make a mixed salad and going to have some pieces of pineapple. If you have here pineapple pieces that you can find not in syrup, but just in pineapple juice, so you can drain the juice off, that's also okay. Um, small portion, remember, for um, the winter months when you can't get hold because pineapple often needs to be imported. Then I've put here for the Tuesday where we had egg, I've put in an omelet with pita bread. You just have baby tomatoes and cucumber pieces, really fast meal. I've put here a bit of a challenged meal, falafel, um, and her bulgur. Falafel is one of my favorites because it's so quickly, so easy, tin, mash up, put your herbs and spices and you can fry and you can freeze it. But if you don't want to do, I've had chickpeas here, you can do, uh, for example, uh, you can change this meal to a uh, hummus with, uh, with some toast crudités. So you can see I've put in, wherever I've put in a food, I've now kind of changed it to a meal, salmon ba uh, pasta bake with dill, with mashed sweet potato and broccoli. I've put here where we had egg, I've put in a savory French toast. So we, you, you uh, make the French toast, but you put chopped herbs and, that, and you have peppers and cucumber crudités. So you can see every meal where you've kind of now put in your protein and your vegetables and your carbohydrates, you've now taken that and saying, okay, what can I do with that meal to make it easy? And this is where you need to decide how much time do I have? Again, here on this day, French toast is a really fast meal, very quick, and you can have your peppers. Here, chicken strip, mashed potato, and leftover broccoli. So I've taken the broccoli from the day before, and you keep it, and it's a broccoli salad with olive oil and lemon. So think what have you got? What can I save from the day before? And you can really work your menu that way. So I have now taken this menu because I'm sure there will be parents here kind of going, I can't, my child can't have, you know, um, the mixed nut butter. My child can't have the peanut butter. My child can't have milk. So I've just given here the same menu, 100% the same, but I've replaced all of the milks with an oat milk. You know, here is oat milk all of the yogurts with a coconut uh, yogurt. These are cocoa is a calcium enriched yogurt. I've replaced the cheese with cocoa is enriched, uh, calcium enriched cheese. So you can replace that. But uh, here, those small little tips you can get also from your dietitian where there's uh, peanut butter. I've replaced that with sun butter. Sun butter is a guaranteed not free butter. It is, it's got a may contain traces of soya on there. So you can take this menu if you were gluten-free, if you were milk-free, then you would change the oat porridge to gluten-free um, oat porridge. Um, and what you would want here is where you take the pita bread, you take a gluten-free um, uh, uh, flat bread, for example. So every meal you can change 
and you can change it around to your dietary requirements for your child and hopefully also that you don't run a restaurant service for the family. I'm going to end this uh, workshop with some detail because what you did not see is fluid. Now, of course, uh, fluid uh, in children and for you as adults should be water and milk or milk replacement should be main sources of fluid. As a general rule of thumb, total fluid per day works like this. It's 100 milliliters per for the first 10 kilograms. And after that, for the second 10 kilograms, it's 50 milliliters for the second 10 kilograms. And after that, 20 milliliters for the further weight. So if your child is 10 kilograms, your child needs a total of a liter of total fluid per day. If your child is 12 kilograms, your child needs 1.1 liters because it is for 12. So for the first 10, it's 100 milliliters. For the next 10, it's a 50. So that's two, that's another 100. Now, remember, that does not mean it's only water and milk. You get fluid also from, if you're doing a porridge in the morning, there's 100 milliliters of 150 milliliters of water or milk in there, that counts as fluid. If you're having fruit um, uh, during the day, fruit is very uh, fluid rich. So most of the days uh, we estimate around 150 to 200 milliliters of fluid also coming from food itself. But water and milk is really an important part, particularly when your child gets older, the amount of milk, it would be more yogurt and cheeses that they have. So you need to make sure that they get um, their water. I do get questions about teas. So herbal teas um, can be used, you know, something like a chamomile tea. I normally stay away from, you know, your uh, peppermint tea. Peppermint, actually mint itself is a gastric stimulant. So it stimulates uh, the release of, of um, uh, acid in your stomach. Um, and you know, uh, teas like, for example, those with ginger, they have got certain functions. So ginger also stimulates your peristalsis as a digestive. So when I say herbal teas, I would stick to your calming herbal teas, but definitely would not sweeten them with honey or any sugar if you use herbal teas. Avoid caffeine in all forms and avoid tannin. So I do get this question to say, Rosanna, I've got English breakfast tea, but the English breakfast tea is caffeine free. Can I give that? Still, I would stay away from English breakfast tea because especially in the young, because it still contains tannins. Uh, I know uh, in, in Britain, having tea is very not normal, but also for you as adults, be aware outside of the tea, English breakfast tea containing caffeine. I don't have any English breakfast tea after two o'clock in the afternoon. I don't drink any coffee as well, but it's, a, um, it's the timing when you have your tea. If you have your tea with your breakfast, then it will affect the absorption of your iron. So when you have your tea, try to have your tea not too close to an iron source because it will impact on the absorption of iron and it can also impact on calcium. Avoid fruit juices. I cannot uh, re reinforce that. Fruit juices are seen as refined sugar, squashes and any other sugary drinks. It is a treat if they have it and if they have it, it should be diluted. If you are vegan or vegetarian, then there might be a role, but only in the form of pure orange juice. So for example, if you squeeze a small amount in the morning to in increase the iron absorption, but it's good to discuss that with your dietitian because uh, having, for example, some uh, apple, if you have uh, uh, for, with your breakfast, a nut butter, that alone has got sufficient vitamin C to increase your uh, iron absorption. So it does not need to be that you're constantly squeezing some juices. So uh, as far as possible, stay away from them, have them as a treat. And when you give them as a treat, it's really, really diluted. And I, when I say diluted, it's a one in five dilution. It's a really um, a diluted form of uh, fruit juice. And carbonated drinks avoid. And for me, that's also uh, carbonated water. Uh, carbonated water fills children up, so it's got bubbles, so it fills children up and it's, it's not from that perspective. And bicarbonate, they don't need it um, in their diet as well. So if you give water, it's just normal still water. 
If we're thinking about um, the whole family, I've already started um, hinting towards that. Use cooking methods that are quick and where you can reheat. So really think about that. I have got a blog on my website where I talk about heating and the safety when you're talking about freezing to also fridge reheating, freezer reheating. It's really important that you use basic hygiene. The NHS and the Food Standard Agency also have got tips on, on freezing and reheating. Think about foods that can be reused in a different dish on a next day. So it might be, for example, on one day you have sweet potato and broccoli. On the next day, you could use those, um, add some lentils, boil them in water, add them and whiz them up and you have a nice soup. Think about stews. Uh, can you, on the one day you have the vegetables in pieces, the next day you reuse them in a stew. I am a big fan of fritters. So especially in, in children that are fussy eaters, for example, that you grate your, um, your courgettes, you add some uh, onions, you add some potato, and you put maybe some strips of chicken and fish in there, and an egg, bind it and fry it. Um, if you can't use egg, there are plenty of tips on how you uh, use different binding agents that are not egg-based. Um, those are quick and easy. Uh, dips. Uh, hummus is a classic guacamole, so bringing in a, a vegetable and a fat sauce in that way. Butter beans work so well in a dip. I often uh, use roast vegetables, whiz them up, put tahini in there, uh, put some herbs, and you have a wonderful dip that they can dip in their, uh, their vegetable, uh, uh, vegetables or a toast soldier. Uh, another tip is uh, roasting vegetables, adding some cream cheese to them and whizzing them up. If, if your child can't have cream cheese, there are uh, the vegan variety of cream cheeses as well. Then also for the whole family, I, my recommendation is if you're doing a curry, for example, or a stew, cook without salt. As a principle, just use your herbs and spices. And then every family member, depending on their age, can add salt if needed. We are raising a generation that should be healthier than, than us. So the idea would be that you don't need to use any salt um, and that the new generation uh, and that we as well, we are enjoying the herbs and spices, but not the salt itself. And then the last step is thinking about making it more sustainable. So we talked about the fruit and the vegetables, bringing those that are in season, thinking, thinking about the frozen sources as well, sometimes tinned and looking at the tin where the tin sources come from, but be careful of the sugar and the salt in the tins. Thinking about a good mix between plant-based protein, meat and fish. So you could see from the flexitarian approach that I've taken, I've had two days of red meat, two days of chicken, and I had two sources of fish. The rest were all plant-based sources of protein. Think about your source of meat and fish. Where do they come from? Think about your local butcher. Where does the meat come from? Uh, your local fish sources rather than having imported uh, fish sources. Um, avoid throwing away food, so using leftovers from the day. And think about local mi milk, cheese and yogurt sources. We often buy yogurts and the yogurts actually are imported from different countries. So you can actually be more sustainable just by thinking about where your foods come from. So this is the end of this workshop. I hope it was useful. Um, and I want to also just uh, it's not part of the workshop, but think about treats. Um, the treats, they don't fit in for me as part of a standard menu. Um, they really have a significant nutritional value. I know a lot of parents ask me and saying, but you know, not chocolate contains, improves your serotonin, so makes you more happier. And chocolate can really uh, make a child, uh, you know, it's got potassium. Yes, you know, within reason but it's really a it's a, a it's a treat and refined sugars are very high in most of the treats i would keep them to the minimum for me a treat is ideally no more than once uh, a week twice if really need to be um, of course we're going uh, for christmas and for birthdays those are exceptions so treats are not something that you would be building in a menu it's something that comes on top and should be 
uh, less frequent than uh, something that a child should be getting uh, on a daily basis. Right, I hope this was useful and I hope you've enjoyed the workshop. I am very active on social media. You can also look on my website and you will find that I see, uh, 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 I have constantly on my calendar new webinars, but you will also find webinars that are recorded, both free uh, and some that are um, uh, available on a small fee on uh, the webinar link on my, um, my webpage. You can also find me on Facebook. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. I post on Instagram constantly new ideas for uh, recipes. I'm also on Twitter. Um, so you can follow me there and I hope this was really useful and that you can uh, plan your own menus now at home. As your children grow older, you use exactly the same principles. Thank you very much.